Boca Tov, Havarim. It's good morning, friends. Burachim Habe'im. Blessings on you all.
soaking it. We're all often in a rush, aren't we? Life is a rush. But what is today? Today is Shabbat. Shabbat is a time of rest. Rest, not just from our work, but rest from the rush and the things that often occupy our time and our mind. And it's really important that we just Rest mm. and listen, hear from him. You know, in our rush and our rush, uh, the bustle of life, we often think we hear. But do we actually hear? And sometimes it takes a bit of that time to really just push the things aside to actually hear what the Ruach HaGadash, the Holy Spirit is saying to us, speaking to us so that we can actually fulfill and do what his word has asked of us and to remind ourselves that we're in his service, mm. not our own. <laughs> so it's nice. So this parasha this morning is on Balak. It's interesting. Sharon is going to bless us this morning with the word. But before that, we've got some wonderful reading to do. So we start off with Bamidba. It's numbers. And then we'll continue on for the next part, which is the Haftarah, which is in I think, Micah. 
and that's followed by the Brit Shah, which is the New Covenant. Thanks, Doug. We've got the very unusual story of a witch doctor who prays to the God of Israel and who is rebuked by a donkey. <laughs> When Balak, the son of Zippor, realised that Ben Israel um, had done to the Ammonites, Moab became terrified because there were so many people. Moab was filled with dread because of Ben Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, the multitude will lick up everything around us like ox licks up the grass of the field. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at the time, and he sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, at Pethor, near the river, um, in his native land, saying, Look now, a people has come out of Egypt. See now, they cover the surface of the earth, and are settling beside me. Come now, curse this people for me, because they are too strong for me. Perhaps I will be able to defeat them and drive them away from the country. I know that whoever you bless will be blessed, and whoever you curse will be cursed. The elders of, Midi of Moab and Midian left with divination fees in their hand. When they came to Balaam, they told him Balak's words. He said to them, Spend the night here and I will give you an answer, just as Adonai uh, speaks to me. So the officials of Moab stayed with Balaam. God said to Balaam who asked, and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent word to me. See, the people coming out of Egypt cover the surface of the land. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight against them and drive them away. God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. Do not curse them, for they are blessed. So Balaam got up in the morning and said to the officials of Balak, Go back to your country, for Adonai has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials got up and went back to Balak, and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Balak again sent other dignitaries, more numerous and honoured than these previous ones. And they also came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, son of Zippor, Please let nothing keep you from coming to me. I will richly reward you and everything you tell me, to, me I will do. Just come now and curse this people for me. But Balaam answered Balak's servants, Even if Balak gave me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot cross beyond the mouth of Adonai my God to do anything small or great. But now you may spend a night here, then I might find out anything else Adonai may say to me. God came to Balaam by night and said to him, Since the men came to you to summon you, arise and go with them. However, the word I tell you, you are to do. Uh, Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his she-donkey and went with the officers of Moab. God's wrath flared because he was going and an angel of Adonai so stood on the road to impede him. He was riding on his she-donkey and his two young men were with him. The she-donkey saw the angel of Adonai standing on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. So the she-donkey turned away from the road and went into the field. Then Balaam, uh, Balaam struck the she-donkey to turn it back onto the road. The angel of Adonai stood in the path 
of the vineyards. Um, a fence on this side and a fence on that side. The she-donkey saw the angel of Adonai and pressed against the wall, and it pressed Balaam's leg against the wall, and he continued to strike it. The angel of Adonai went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn right or left. The she-donkey saw the angel of Adonai and, cr and crouched beneath Balaam. Balaam's anger flared, and he struck the she-donkey with the staff. Adonai opened the mouth of the she-donkey, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you struck me these three times? Balaam said to the she-donkey, Because you mocked me. If only there were a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. The she-donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your she-donkey that you have ridden upon me all your life until this day? Have I been accustomed to do such a thing to you? He said, No. Then Adonai uncovered Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of Adonai standing on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. He bowed his head and prostrated himself on his face. The angel of Adonai said to him, For what reason did you strike your she-donkey these three times? Behold, I went out to impede, for you hastened on a road to oppose me. The she-donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. Had it not turned away from you, I would now have killed you and let it live. Balaam said to the angel of Adonai, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing opposite me on the road. And now, if it is evil in your eyes, I shall return. The angel of Adonai said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak to you, that shall you speak. So Balaam went with the officers of Balak. Balak heard that Balaam had come, so he went out toward him to the city of Moab, which is on the border of Arnon, which is at the edge of the border. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send to you to summon you? Why did you not go to me? Am I not capable of honoring you? Balaam said to Balak, Behold, now I have come to you. Am I empowered to say anything? Whatever word God puts into my mouth, that shall I speak. Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kerath Huzoth. Balak slaughtered cattle and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the officers who were with him. And it was in the morning. Balak took Balaam and brought him to the heights of Baal, and from there he saw the edge of the people. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here and prepare me here seven bulls and seven rams. So Balak did just as Balaam had said. Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, Stay here beside your offering. I will go and perhaps Adonai will meet me. Wherever, <clears throat> whatever message he shows me, I will tell you. Then he went to a barren height. God met with Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared seven altars, and on each altar I have offered a bull and a ram. Adonai put a message into Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and speak this. Balaam went back to him. Behold, he was standing beside his offering with all his, the princes of Moab. Then he uttered his oracle and said, From Aram, Balak brought me. Moab's kings from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. <clears throat> How can I curse one whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce one whom Adonai has not denounced? From the rocky peaks I see him, from the heights I behold him. Look, he lives as a nation apart and does not consider himself as being like the other nations. Who can count Jacob's dust? Who can number a fourth of Israel? Let my soul die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but look, you're actually blessing them. But in response he said, Mustn't I speak whatever Adonai puts into my mouth? Then Balak said to him, Come now with me to another place where you can see a part of them only, not all of them. Curse them f for me from there. He took him to the lookout field on top of 
Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Okay. So, and he said to Balak, Stand here by your ascending offering while I meet over there. And Jehovah came to Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak and say this. So he went to him and saw him standing by his ascending offering and the heads of Moab with him. And Balak asked him, What did um, Adonai say? And he took up his proverb and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, listen to me, son of Zippor. El is not a man to lie, nor a son of man to repent. Has he said, and would he not do it, or spoken, and would not confirm it? See, I have received to bless, and he has blessed, and I do not reverse it. He has not looked upon wickedness in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Yahweh his Elohim is with him, and the shout of a sovereign is in him. El who brought them out of Egypt um, um, is for them like the horns of a wild ox. And I just want to say that in the, um, in the King James, it says unicorn. And there's much confusion today about that because the unicorn today is a, uh, like a um, magical horse with a magical horn, but a mythical horse. But um, the KJV came under great criticism because of that. But they were meaning um, the rhinoceros unicornus, which was the Indian rhinoceros, and that actually is a great powerful beast, and it's underestimating the wonderful power in the wild ox or wild bull in the original Hebrew, which is rat, rat arm, um, is that God's unstoppable. You know, that rhino is unstoppable, that wild ox, unless the Almighty harnesses it. So it's that mighty power that was um, like similar to the strength of Israel. So uh, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. Now it is said to Jacob and to Israel, what has El done? Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up, up like a lion. It lies not down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. And Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said to Balak, Have I not spoken to you, saying, All that Adonai speaks, that I will do. And Balak said to Balaam, Please come, let me take you to another place. It might be right in the eyes of Elohim that you curse them for me from there. He's not giving up, is he? <laughs> and Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. And Balaam said to Balak, Build seven slaughter places for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on each slaughter place. And uh, I just wanted to say that the, the ram the original name for the wild oxen in the Hebrew is also the original name of the constellation now called Taurus. And um, Ram is, and its star family, may well be the most exciting because it foretells the second coming of Christ. And uh, that's the true redemption story in the stars. So chapter 24 begins, How Lovely the Tents of Jacob. When Balaam realised it was pleasing in the eyes of Adonai to bless Israel, he did not resort to sorceries as at the other times, but turned his face toward the wilderness, lifting up his eyes. Balaam sought Israel dwelling by tribes. The Ruach, <coughs> excuse me. The Ruach Elohim came to him. He uttered his oracle and said, this is the oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, and the oracle of a strong man whose eye has been opened. The oracle of one hearing God's speech, one seeing Shaddai's vision, one fallen down, yet with open eyes. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that are spread out like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by Adonai, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, his seed by abundant water. His king will be greater than Agag. His kingdom will be exalted. God is bringing him out of Egypt 
like the strong horns of a wild ox. He devours nations hostile to him. He will crush their bones, his arrows will pierce them. He crouches like a lioness or like a lion or a lioness. And who would rouse him? He who blesses you will be blessed, and he who curses you will be cursed. <clears throat> then Balaam became furious at Balaam. Balak became furious at Balaam and struck his hands together. Balak said to Balaam, I summon you to curse my enemies, but look, you've blessed them these three times. Now go home. I said I would reward you, but see, Adonai has kept you from reward. Balaam answered Balak, didn't I indeed tell your messengers whom you sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the mouth of Adonai to do good or bad from my own heart. Whatever Adonai may speak, I will speak. Now behold, I am going back to my people. Come, let me counsel you what these people will do to your people in the latter days. Then he, he uttered his oracle. The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the strong man whose eye is opened, the oracle of one hearing God's speech, one experiencing Elion's knowledge, one seeing Shaddai's vision, one fallen down yet with his open eyes. I see him, yet not at this moment. I behold him, yet not in this location. For a star I will come from Jacob. A scepter will arise from Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, and the skulls of all the sons of Seth. Edom will be conquered. His enemies will conquer Seir, but Israel will triumph. One from Jacob will rule and destroy the city's survivors. Then he saw Amalek, so he uttered his oracle and said, Amalek was the first of nations, but will come to ruin at last. Then he saw the Kenite, so he uttered his oracle and said, your dwelling is secure, your nest is set in the rock. Yet Cain will be destroyed when Asher captures you. Again he uttered his oracle and said, Oh, you can live when God does this. Ships will come from Ketam's shore. They will afflict Asher and Eber, but they, will, they too will come to destruction. Then Balaam got up and went and returned to his own place, and Balak went on his way. <coughs> the Moabites' seduction and Phineas arises. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the people began to have immoral sexual relations with women from Moab. Then they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. So the people were eating and bowing down before their gods. When Israel became bound to Baal of Peor, the anger of Adonai grew hot against Israel. Adonai said to Moses, Seize all the ringleaders and hang them before Adonai facing the sun, so that Adonai's fierce anger may be turned away from Israel. So Moshe said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill your men who have been joining themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, a man from B'nai Israel came and brought a Midianite, Midianite woman to his brothers before the eyes of Moshe and of the whole assembly of B'nai Israel while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron the Kohen, saw it, he arose from the midst of the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced through them through, both the Israelite man and the woman's belly. Then the plague among B'nai Israel was stopped. However, 24,000 were dead because of the plague.
5 and starting at verse 6. Now the remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from Adonai, like abundant showers on grass that does not wait for a man, nor lingers for the sons of men. For the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the forest beasts, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if passed through, would trample and tear to pieces, and there would be no deliverer. May your hand be raised up against your adversaries, and may all your foes be cut off now in that day. It is a declaration of Adonai. I will cut off your horses among you, and will destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land, and throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you will have no more divin diviners. I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you, so you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. 
I will uproot your Asherah poles from among you and destroy your cities, so I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations that have not trusted, not listened. Adonai pleads his case. Hear what Adonai is saying. Arise, contend with the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear Adonai's dispute, O mountains, and enduring foundations of the earth, for Adonai has a dispute with his people, and he will argue his case with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Answer me. When I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember, please, what did Balak the king of Moab propose? What did Balaam, son of Beor, answer him? From Shittim, as far as Gilgal, so that you might acknowledge the righteous acts of Adonai. With what shall I come before Adonai, and with what shall I bow myself before God on high? Shall I present him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will Adonai be pleased with thousands of rams, or hordes of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, and the fruit of my belly for the sin of my soul? He has told you, humanity, what is good. And what Adonai is seeking from you, only to practice justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's read, read that again. He has told you, humanity, what is good. And what Adonai is seeking from you, only to practice justice to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And that's what society needs today. Doesn't it? It's interesting, there's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of people that need love. And there's certainly a lot of people that need to walk humbly before God and it's your responsibility and my responsibility to be that example it's quite a challenge at times isn't it quite a challenge but that's the challenge that's the challenge how exciting it's exciting So it's right, a good time right now just to be praying for one another. And if anyone needs healing or just needs encouragement, just to ask the person beside you for that. Or ask someone within the congregation to pray with you, bless you, and lift you up so that you too will be able to, in all strength, Practice justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. The fruit of the faithful. The next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he would find any fruit on it. When he came up to it, he found nothing except leaves, because it wasn't the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and started to drive out those selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those selling doves. And he wouldn't let anyone carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer 
for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. The ruling Kohanim and Torah scholars heard this and began looking for a way to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. Whenever evening came, Yeshua and his disciples would leave the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree shriveled from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Yeshua, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has shriveled up. And Yeshua answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Amen. I tell you, if someone says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but trusts that what he says is happening, so shall it be for him. For the reason I say to you, whatever you pray and ask, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your transgressions. Again, they come to Jerusalem while Jesus, Jesus was walking in the temple, the ruling Kohanim, Torah scholars and elders came up to him and they start saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Yeshua said to them, I will put one question to you, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The immersion of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. They began to dialogue among themselves, saying, If we say, from heaven, he will say, Then why didn't you believe him? But if we say, from men, they were afraid of the crowd, for all held that John really was a prophet. So answering Yeshua, they say, We don't know. And Yeshua tells them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there were also, will also be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their immoral ways, and as a result, the way of the truth will be maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but threw them into Sheol. He put them in chains of gloomy darkness to be held until the judgment. He did not spare the ancient world. He preserved only Noah, a proclaimer of righteousness, along with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He devastated the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, reducing them to ashes, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. He rescued Lot, a righteous man, deeply troubled by the shameless immorality of the wicked. For that righteous man, while living among them, was tormented in his righteous soul day after day by lawless deeds he saw and heard. Therefore, the Lord certainly knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous being punished until the day of judgment, especially those who follow after the flesh in its unclean desires and who despise the Lord's authority. Brazen and arrogant, these people do not tremble while slandering glorious beings. Yet even angels, those stronger and more powerful, do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people are like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be captured and killed. They malign what they don't understand, and in their destruction they will be utterly destroyed. They will 
they will be paid back for what they have done, evil for evil. They consider carousing in broad daylight a pleasure. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceitful pleasures while feasting together with you. They have eyes full of idolatry that never stop sinning, enticing unstable souls. They have hearts trained in greed, a cursed brood. They have abandoned the straight way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he received a rebuke for his wrongdoing. A dumb donkey spoke with a man's voice and put a stop to the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. The gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for them. For by mouthing grandiosities that amount to nothing, they entice in sensual fleshly passions those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For a person is a slave to whatever has overcome him. For if, after escaping the world's pollutions through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Yeshua, the Messiah, they again become entangled in these things and are overcome. The end for them has become worse than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after learning about it to turn back from the holy commandment passed on to them. Woe to them, for they went the way of Cain. They were consumed for pay in Balaam's era, and in Korah's rebellion, they have been destroyed. So we're over at uh, the Revelation, chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of Messiah's community in Pergamum, write, Thus says the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you live where Satan's throne is. Yet you continue to hold firm to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan resides. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who was teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before Benai Israel, to eat food sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Ruach is saying to Messiah's communities. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and written on the stone a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. It's great to see you. We had such a lovely time last night. I hope you got to book in and go to a shared Shabbat last night. We're going to have them again. So, yeah, it's really, it was really nice to, just to sit around the table and talk and laugh and be family. So, yeah, it was good. Thank you to the other hosts. That um, I know Jenny and Alan had a very, very busy week, and yet they had people in their home. So it was really nice. Thank you. So last week, I hope you had a good week. Last week was, I felt, a really amazing service. We laughed together and we cried together and we sang and it was very special. And we heard about the red heifer. And just because we don't understand it or might not see it with our natural eyes doesn't mean that um, nothing's happening. How good that is. 
know, when we pray, sometimes I think, well, Lord, how, how else should I pray? Um, because I can't see anything's happening, but I just start to thank him that he knows what he's doing and that something is happening. He is answering. He is, which is so good. So if that's a word for you today, he is answering your prayer. And the wonderful illustration of God's grace and plan and the hyssop and the cedar and the scarlet thread. I, I love that. A picture of our sin, our forgiveness and all that Adonai has done for us through Yeshua. And we were challenged to be thirst quenchers and I hope we did that this last week. I guess if we're being salt, then we have to make people thirsty and then when they're thirsty, we give them something to drink. We've got a package deal. Well, this week, this funny... Um, the funny readings is about a donkey, and I found a donkey clip. You might have seen it already, but I wanted to show it today, so thank you, Lynn. It's a mite of 10 ad, but it's cute. <laughs> just have a look out for, for Kong the donkey. Just go on YouTube and watch it, it just makes you laugh. <laughs> so there were some very colourful characters in our readings today. We had Balaam. An illustration of being unfaithful, stubborn, reckless, and scheming. He was a false prophet. And on first reading, you can think, but he did such a nice job. But when you read what I love about the readings we do, it's, it gathers all the readings together about this man, and you see the true character of him. Which reminds me, when we first meet somebody... Uh, we get a picture of them, and it's as you get to know them and see the fruit of their life that you really understand what's going on in their heart. And that's a challenge for us, isn't it? The donkey is probably my favourite character of the stories today, apart from Adonai, because well, he's always my favourite. Um, the donkey was so faithful. He'd, he would have obeyed his master for such a long time, and he saves his silly master's life by sitting down on the job. I love it. And we've talked a lot about donkeys in the last week and, and there's some lovely donkeys in, um, on State Highway on the corner of where you go into the Polytech. There's someone there who breeds or looks, has donkeys and they just, they intrigue me. And then we've got Balak the king from the line of Noah. From, he's a Moabite. And he was afraid when he saw what Israel had done to the Amorites. And in the readings, it said he was filled with dread. So he had a cunning plan because he believed in blessings and curses. He was a magician trained in the occult and magic, and he was a spiritual mercenary, a heathen sorcerer. He wasn't a conventional war maker. Most other kings would have gathered some other countries around and ganged up on Israel, but no, he calls a magician. Um, he thought their combined powers would defeat Israel, but his power is nothing compared to our God Almighty. How, that's a word for you today. No matter what it is, his power is greater, stronger, and more definite and more faithful than anything we can face. So his name means waste or to lay waste. So there's not many babies called Balak in the world. And of course... Adonai Elohim, so faithful when we are not faithful, so loving when we are not loving, so patient with us. I just often thank him for being patient with me because sometimes I just take a long time to get things, a long time to understand, but he knows how we're made. He knows our frame and he is patient with us because, you know, it'd be easy for him just to flick us off the earth. Goodbye, I've had enough of you. We've definitely not had enough of you, though. Thank you for coming. And Balaam. Well, God allowed him to go his own way to complete ruin. And there is so many... Well, there's such a dilemma in this story that raises a lot of questions. If God didn't want Balaam to go, why didn't he just tell him to turn around and go home? And if God said it was okay for Balaam to go, why did the angel block him? And how, how would we react? Sometimes we ask God for something and we don't like the answer, so we ask again. And this is what Balaam did. I don't think he really liked the answer, so he asked again. And it's a bit of a challenge in my life about some things that I've asked for. Did I get them just because I nagged? 
Or did I get them because it was God's perfect will in my life? That is a real challenge for us because then you hear the story in the Gospels about the widow who was commended for asking an unjust judge over and over and over again. And so, you know, as believers, we've thought, well, that's the way to pray. But Balak, he gets in trouble because he asked twice and got the wrong, he, he, he got the wrong thing. I don't want the wrong thing. I want the perfect will of God in my life. In Numbers 22, Balak asked Balaam to curse the Israelites. And Balaam in verse 8 says to Balak's elders, Stay here for the night and I'll see what Adonai says. And really, he should, what should he have said? No, I'm not coming with you. If he loved Israel and he loved his people, he should have said no. So there's another clip on YouTube. Uh, who, you know, the 12 ways that believers say no. I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. I'm not sure. I'll go and read my Bible about it. When really, we should just say no. No, we're not going to do that. So Balaam expected Adonai to speak to him. And yet, why did he expect, expect Adonai would say, yes, I'll curse Israel when God loves Israel and would never do it? Why, why would he do that? And the elders had bought him divination fees. Not a koha, not a thank you present, not a bottle of wine. Divination fees. So they were expecting Balaam to curse Israel. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of muddle too. And it reminds me of the story when Elijah says no to the gift when, um, what was his name? Na Naaman was healed from leprosy. Elijah said, no, I don't want a gift. But what did his servant do? Gehazi. Gehazi's kind of a real trickster kind of name, runs after him, tells a lie that, well, we've got visitors coming, can we have a gift? And um, Gehazi goes back with the gift, and Elijah say, Elisha says to him, uh, who are those men with you? As if Elijah, Elisha didn't know. So um, it looks to me, you know, you've got to be really careful when you're receiving a gift for what God has done really um, challenges me as a pastor about that. You know, we can't receive. We can't, yes, a, a workman is worthy of their hire, but as soon as you, because I've thought, well, we could, at a gala, you could have, a, you know, pay for a prayer. Well, that's bordering on this, isn't it? <laughs> you pay me and I'll pray for you. No, God never intended that because prayer is free. And his answers are free. Um, when Elijah was, it, it, and it interests me how many questions God answers, asks. When Elijah was having a pity party in the cave after a mighty success against the prophets of Baal, um, Adonai says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? As if God doesn't know. <laughs> and he says, uh, in, in the same as uh, you know, we talked about before with Elisha. Oh no, when Balaam says the king's, um, elders are at his house and God says to Balaam, so who are these men? As if God didn't know. It seems God asks rhetorical questions that he already knows the answer to. So what he, why does he ask? It reminds me of my mum when I've been doing something bad and said, what do you think you're doing? Well, I know what I'm doing. I've got my hand in the cookie jar. Or when I was late home and she said, where have you been? She already knew where I was. It was a rhetorical question. You know, God asks more questions in the scriptures than everyone else put together, even in the readings today. And often, and I've been thinking, well, that's the way he gets my attention. His words, his questions start with who, where, when, have you, can you, and do you know? We ask questions because we lack information. God has all the information, and yet he still asks a question. I think he's doing it to call us to a halt. And this should have been a sign to Balak that, oops, God's asking me something. I should stop and have a think about it. To make us think what we're doing, I think that's why he asks us a question. I remember a day, I may have told you before, I stood at the kitchen sink thinking very negative stuff allowing my thoughts to get more negative by the minute. Good morning. Yes, off you go. going to sit with Dad. Yep, off you go. And um, 
the Holy Spirit asked me a question. So I'm standing at the sink, more negative thoughts, but none of you would be like this, but I am. And more negative thoughts coming down my brain. And the Holy Spirit says to me, where are you going <laughs> with my thoughts? And I knew to stop thinking that way and that it wasn't pleasing to God. So sometimes when we're asking God for a word, sometimes it comes in a question. What do you think you're doing? What did I tell you last time? He's so patient with us, isn't he? Anyway, back to numbers. It seems in this story, Adonai changed his mind and because perhaps he hoped, had hoped that Balaam would have paid attention the first time. Reality is we want to go down the path we want to follow, sometimes for complete disregard for what we know is right and what we know would please Adonai. God knew Balaam wasn't going to take no for an answer, so God allowed him to go with a warning. Sounds like the children of Israel when they wanted a king. He knew that they shouldn't have a king, but he gave them one with conditions. We need to learn that it's never any good coming uh, to settle for less than God's perfect will. Balaam, he was the son of Beor from Aram of ancient Syria, and he was of similar descent to Hamar, that wicked man in the story of Esther. His name means not of the people, a madman or a corrupter of the people. According to Jewish tradition, Jacob's uncle Laban had a song, son called Beor, who was the father of Balaam, which makes Laban Balaam's grandson. Balaam is called a cursing prophet and is a distant relation of the Jewish people. So what was he doing thinking that he would curse them? So why did God give him the gift of prophecy? Why, if Balaam really loved God's people, would he go to agree to curse them? Balaam seemingly did everything that was right, but the scriptures, as we've read today, um, repeatedly condemn him. In his heart, he didn't have Israel's uh, welfare at heart. He was greedy. He was a prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, but he wanted a prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. He wanted the money. He was unfaithful. He had a disregard for God's will, and he knew not to go with Balak, but he wanted the money. And he was spared from death by a donkey. Amazing that God can speak through a rebellious prophet and a donkey to achieve his will. And this is no reason for us to be rebellious. Or don't listen to talking animals. Or don't wait for an animal to talk to you, to be obedient to God. Because the last I looked, the only talking donkey I know about is in Shrek. And believe me, he's not real. <laughs> we need to be careful about being motivated by riches and be careful about whose advice we're going to take. We can't be cursed when we walk in his obedience. We can be if we willingly break his commandments because the wall of protection around us can be broken. Yeshua has asked us to pray and to bless others and to love others. As believers, we can be hated and persecuted. We need to do what Yeshua says, not what we feel like doing. Because that, that when someone's mean to us and we rise up, you can feel it in your heart, rise up and you just want to give them a piece of your mind. And as Joel said yesterday to the lovely folks of Aspen, how, watch out how many pieces of mind you give away or you won't have a mind left. <laughs> Some say that Balaam was an anti-Semite. He hate, just as Satan hates the relationship that the children of Israel has with God, so did Balaam. Three times in three places, Balaam was asked to curse the Israelites. But what happened? God put words in his mouth. How exciting is that? No excuse for his disobedience, but when God wanted it done, God wants it done. And borrowing from the first fruits of Sion extract, it said King, King Balak retained Balaam to curse Israel with misfortune and sorrow. Balaam attempted to place a curse on Israel three times. Each time the Lord turned the curse into a blessing. Instead of cursing Israel, Balaam involuntarily spoke prophetic oracles of blessing over Israel. The oracles of Balaam offer simple 
several glimpses of Messiah and point toward his coming. So in the first attempt, um, Numbers records in verse 5, Adonai put a message into Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and speak this. And it reminds me of that scripture in Matthew where it says, And when you hand it over, don't worry about what you're going to say because the spirit of the Father will speak through you. And how much more he can do that, because our desire is for God and is for Israel. He can do that way more, well, I think, more easily than he could to Balak, whose intentions were, were crooked. In his second attempt, Balaam exclaimed that he saw no misfortune or trouble in store for Israel. Instead, they were blessed because the Lord his God is with him. And Balaam went on to say, the shout of the king is among them. The shout of the king. And the word translated as shout is the Hebrew teruah, the same word commonly used to describe a trumpet blast. Numbers could be translated, the trumpet blast of a king is among them. So he was prophesying, when he was meant to be cursing, the coming of the king who's coming with a trumpet blast. Because the Apostle Paul mentions the shout of Messiah's trumpet when he says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet blast of the king mentioned by Balaam certainly alludes to the trumpet of Messiah. He is the coming king. How exciting is that? <laughs> and though we may, he may not, we may not have heard the shofar blast yet for when he comes back, his trumpets are already resounding in his midst. Each time we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, we rehearse the day of his coming. We may not hear the trumpets of Messiah yet, but the unseen world of spiritual darkness certainly does. And when Balaam attempted to curse the people of God, he heard the deafening blast of the trumpet of Messiah. And then the third time Balak blesses Israel, he was awestruck by the glory of God. And verse 5 of his blessing, which says, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob! and your dwellings, O Israel, the Jewish people have turned into a prayer. So they've joined several verses together, and this is the first verse for the Matov. And it's a prayer that people pray on their way to the synagogue that gets their heart ready. You know, we meet together for prayer um, at the beginning of the service. You're welcome to come. We, we gather at about half past nine. And it's a time where we can get our hearts ready to receive. Hopefully our hearts are always ready. But when we've had a busy morning, sometimes it's nice just to settle it and, and um, talk to the Lord. So with, joined with Psalm 5 verse 8, 26 verse 8, 95 verse 6 and 69 verse 14, they've written a beautiful prayer that they repeat as they're coming into uh, the synagogue for worship. Tense talks about our inner self, and in the second sentence is your dwellings talk about our outer self. These two things measure the quality of our life. How are we on our insides? How is our soul? How is our mind? How is our heart and our attitude? And how are we on the outside? How are our circumstances? How is our place in life? We must learn to be, live in peace with our inner selves. We need to learn to tolerate our shortcomings and failings and practice compassion on ourselves because we can often be, be stopped from doing anything good because that voice in us says, oh, but you'll never amount to anything. You won't be able to. We were talking about that as we were setting up today, the things that our teachers and people have told us that can stop us from being a blessing to each other. Without coming to terms with our own shortcomings and living at peace with ourselves, we can live a life of fear, pain and anger. So we're unable to find our place in the king's kingdom. It's incredible. God turns what was meant for evil to good. So at the end of the story, Balak goes on his way. Balaam got up and returned to his place. And then we read Numbers 25, which we read, which is alluded to in the scriptures and the Jewish tradition would say that Balaam went on to live with the Moabite people because it talks about him dying with the Moabite people. 
And he was the one that advised Balak to erect tents and seat older women at the entrance of the tents to send linen, to sell linen. But on the inside of the tents were the young women ready to seduce anyone who came in to buy things. So at last, he had succeeded in what he did. He cursed Israel. Balaam is mentioned 51 times in the scriptures. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are instructed not to mix with the Ammonites or the Moabites because they didn't give them bread and water on their way out of Egypt. And in verse 5 it says, Because you hired against you Balaam, son of Beor, from Betor of Aram, Naharaim, to curse you. So that he, God held it against them. So we see a picture of Balaam being built and we see the power of our tongue is very powerful. Why would we speak curses over someone who God wants to bless? Someone who is made in God's image. We don't purposely place curses on each other, but we can affect each other by the negative things that we say. We need to speak blessing over each other. We need to be encouraging. Many of us have had false labels spoken over us or, spoke, uh, or spoken false labels over others. Especially as parents, sometimes in the rash moment, you can say things to your children that can impact them for the rest of their lives. Lots of people have been called loser or stupid or you won't amount to much. Joel tells a story of um, a teacher telling him, Van Ameringen, you're never going to amount to anything. And thankfully, Joel's personality is, you can't say that to me, I'll show you. And he showed them. Uh, we can be called clumsy, lazy, hopeless, ugly, bad, worthless, a brat or an idiot, and it can affect us into our adult life. But hallelujah, Yeshua's blood breaks every curse ever spoken, unintentionally or out of ignorance. How good is that? Because in Galatians 3.13, he has become our curse. And when we... And because when we speak negatively of others, we can cut ourselves off or they can get cut off from us. In Genesis 12, 3, it says, When Adonai speaks to Abram, my desire is to bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth will be blessed. How many people and nations are cutting themselves off from blessing by attempting to curse the Jews, just like Balaam did? Balak and many like him have tried to wipe out Israel, but none have succeeded. And why have they survived? Because of his covenant in Jeremiah 31, and I want to read it to you. This is his covenant. This is why they've never been wiped out. Only if this fixed order departs from before me, it is a declaration of Adonai, then also might Israel's offspring cease from being a nation before me for all time. Thus says Adonai, only if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then also I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all they have done. It is a declaration of Adonai. So we can see that Israel is as secure as the stars. When the stars fall out of the sky, then God will turn his back on Israel. In the last days, we will, see, we will see people trying to wipe out Israel, as we see now in these modern days. But no one will succeed unless Israel brings it on themselves, as in Numbers, uh, in the sto in Numbers 25, with sexual immorality and worshipping other gods. And as recorded, 24,000 people died that day. So do we support the blessings of others? Do we celebrate when other people get blessed? Or do we think, oh, I don't know how come they're so good. I didn't get that. Should we, we sometimes treat God like he's got this a finite sack of blessings. And if Nevi gets one, then I miss out. Or if Kevin gets one, then I miss out. But he, it's not like that. He has an infinite no sack, just infinite blessing that he can, but he pours out onto us and onto the nation of Israel. Israel, And we need to support the blessing of them. And I have had recent conversations with believers who are not siding with Israel. And they don't, they're not understanding the big picture 
and the final days and how important Israel is um, to us and should be to us. We need to, to continue to pray for and bless them and each other. Unlike Balak, we can, um, who believed in the power of blessings and cursings, we can downplay the power of them. We think, oh, well, that was just for the scriptures. But Mark 11 that we read says, Peter sees the fig tree and remembers what Yeshua said and exclaimed, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has shriveled up. So our words do have an effect. We can't be cursed when we walk in his obedience. We can if we willingly break his commandments. Yeshua, oh, I've read that page already. As believers, we can be hated and persecuted, but we need to do what Yeshua says. Let's pray that our nation stands alongside Israel as there is a blessing in doing that and because we, are, we know we're praying in God's will. If you struggle and you never know whether you're praying in, God, in God's will, pray for Israel. You know that you're praying <laughs> in God's in his will. As we read in Romans 11 verse 28 and 32, as I've read, concerning chosenness, they, Israel, are loved on account of the fathers for the gifts and the calling of God irrevocable. Even when it comes to Balaam, a wicked prophet, God didn't stop him prophesying. A warning to us that we must be careful who we listen to and we must be careful about what we say. Just because people say they are prophets or your neighbour says they're a prophet doesn't mean they are. And it doesn't mean that what comes out of their mouth is a godly thing. Balaam was a prophet, but he was a wicked prophet. He was a false prophet, like we read about um, this morning. Particularly in these days, we need to be careful. We need to be reading the word and knowing what it says. So when people say, oh, this is what I believe, you can say, well, actually, no, the scriptures say this. Or, or invite them to show you. Where did they find that in the scriptures? We have the advantage of the Ruach Hagodesh leading us and guiding us in all, in all truth. And we have the advantage that we have the scriptures. So we need to be making the most of that, being most of the time. Because Yeshua hasn't left us to our own devices. How wonderful that is. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. A message for Israel as they were being promised to return from exile. A message we can borrow, knowing that Adonai wants us to do the same, to seek him with all our hearts. And in John 10 it says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. If you want to follow him, we have to know his voice. Thankfully, Adonai has Israel and her people in hand. And because we are grafted in, he has us in hand too. We're coming to the last days where we do need to be careful. And this is not a message that I would normally choose to, to speak about because I'm the... It just doesn't feel very pastoral, but it is pastoral in the fact that it's a warning. I really felt a, a real... Um, every time I went to talk, talk to the Lord about my message, he just said, just warn them, just warn them that not to be frightened but to be warned that there are people who say things and do things that are not godly, even though they say they are. And it's a challenge for us too, isn't it? So we need, to, as we come into these days, we need to be careful to cling to his, the Lord, to keep his word, to keep together, to be together, to check out what those things, um, what people are saying to us, be ready to tell others about the love and the plan of Adonai for all his people. So this week I pray that we will use our words and actions to bless others, to think before we talk. That's something I need to work on. Be encouraging, kind and truthful so that Micah 6.8 is something that people say about us, that we would practice mercy, uh, practice justice, we would love mercy we, we would walk humbly with our God because we walk in his authority, don't we? And so we can do those things, even though it seems hard. We can ask him every day to, to, for help so that we can be salt and light in this world. Shabbat shalom.